Because I am the question that if I can find enough, I guess that's no middle question that list all It's time for questions. The executive officer will we'll start with listed questions. Question seven has been withdrawn. I call Roy Beggs. Question number one. I call first minister. Thank you. Together, building a united community is an executive strategy which places responsibilities on all government departments. The development of the summer camp programme and the United Youth programme adopted a co-design approach with key stakeholders and young people. Local engagement with residents, community groups and stakeholders has informed the development of strategic frameworks for each urban village area. Young people are receiving training and mentoring to deliver the cross-community youth sports programme, and this approach of local community engagement is at the heart of together building a united community. We will continue to work with communities to identify local needs, to address local issues, and to deliver positive outcomes for all. I call Gordon Lyons. Mm -hmm. excuse me, uh, Roy, to Roy Beggs. I call Roy Beggs for supplementary. I thank the minister for her answer. But would the Minister acknowledge that with having uh, a wide range of bodies together building a united community, SIFT, SPOD, neighbourhood renewal funding, housing executive councils, that there is a danger of overlapping and dupl duplication in services? And yet there are areas in my constituency, such as Craigie Hill and Antiville, where there is a very weak community uh, 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 support and uh, seems to be missed. So what is uh, the minister, First Minister and the Deputy First Minister doing to ensure that there are areas that are not going miss uh, of support and that where there is a need that is addressed. I thank the member for supplementary. Of course, um, many of these um, schemes are open to applications and if the applications are put in, uh, they are then assessed. And uh, In East Antrim, uh, under TBUC, uh, for example, there have been many good interventions. So, in terms of the summer camp, uh, there have been summer camps at Larne. Um, uh, the EA have also run a Larne Rural Youth Project, and they've also uh, been engaged with Monkstown Boxing Club under the summer camp. Um, they have had money distributed through the District Council Good Relations Programme. Uh, which, of course, will have an impact on East Antrim as well. Uh, the Community Relations Council, through TBUC, has been able to allocate over £10,000 to projects in East Antrim, including the Cairn Castle Ulster Scots Cultural Group, the Carrick Fergus Historical Reenactment Group. Uh, and indeed, there are many uh, other organisations who have been able to avail of CRC's core funding. So it is, in many cases, um, an application process and then the applications are looked at to make sure uh, that they uh, meet with the required uh, methodology and governance that are needed to pay out the money. So uh, if he has any particular groups that aren't being successful in terms of applications that they are putting forward, you know, we're happy to work with him to see if there's a way in which we can build capacity in that particular area, uh, but it is mostly by application. I call Gordon Lyons. Thank you very much, Madam uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the First Minister for her answer and for all the good work that is being done uh, through the TBUC programme? Uh, she will also be aware that the uh, Social Investment Fund is delivering for people in East Antrim through the um, Building Employment uh, through Education uh, programme. Uh, does she agree with me that this is an excellent use of, of resources? It helps uh, people who um, are in work or out of work improve their employability the through free courses. Uh, doesn't she agree that that's a fantastic use of the Social Investment Fund? Well, indeed, the SIF projects in East Antrim, uh, there are uh, four projects that benefit East Antrim, the Community Transport uh, Project, the Mental Health Project, and uh, the Fuel Poverty Project, which has had to be rescoped to make sure that it didn't overlap with uh, projects that were already in place, and the Building to Employment through Education uh, Project, which he has just mentioned. And that particular project has an investment of 3.2 million pounds. Uh, it has two elements focused on increasing employment through uh, education and it's actually a very good example of the work that SIF is doing on the ground in terms of early intervention, making sure that people have the appropriate skills, education, uh, employability, so that they, they can then move into the world of work. And I think some of the employability schemes that are happening right across Northern Ireland have really made an impact and will continue to make an impact. 
Aram Sir Sean Lynch, I call Sean Lynch. I call you. I'm going to ask you to ask him for you. And I want to thank the First Minister for her answer. Could I ask the First Minister to provide an overview of the TEO funding programmes? Well, as I've said, we have the TBUC programmes, uh, and of course, under that, there are seven headlines. It's really a framework, and then a seven uh, different uh, frames under that. So we have the shared uh, and integrated education programme, the United Youth programme, uh, urban villages, of which there are five, uh, the shared neighbourhood programme. Uh, the interface programme, which is trying to remove barriers and walls, and we've been able to uh, move from 59 of those down to now 50. Uh, the cross-community youth sport programme, and of course the summer camps, which I have uh, spoken about as well. So under TPUC, those seven uh, headline programmes are working very well. Some of them uh, will come to a natural end, and we will then be able to see the outworkings of them through the evaluations. I called Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you, First Minister, for the answers to your questions so far. First Minister, how, how can you provide assurance to uh, the communities that you engage with that, they, that the engagement that you have extends beyond your clan base of, the, of your own party, the DUP, and that of Sinn Féin, uh, given the recent uh, issues around charter uh, uh, and other uh, issues that have raised concern in this community at this time? Well, I'm not quite sure what other things he's talking about. Perhaps he can be more specific uh, in a follow-up. But in terms of the SIF uh, programme, uh, all organisations which receive public money are subject to robust checks uh, to ascertain their capability to manage the funding and to make sure that they do it in an appropriate fashion. Um, that's still the case. Uh, it is organisations, uh, not individuals, that are subject to to checks, and the department uh, would not be aware of which individuals in an organisation would be working on any project. So it's the organisations uh, that we are concerned with. And if he's talking about Charter NI, which is a, quite a segue from East Antrim, I have to say, Madam Speaker, um, but uh, if he's talking about Charter NI, that organisation has been in existence with a very robust board for 10 years, and we have no difficulty uh, in working with Charter NI. I call Gordon Dunn. Question two, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. I am pleased to say that arrangements for the Northern Ireland commemoration to mark National Holocaust Memorial Day 2017 are well advanced. The Executive Office has allocated a budget and staffing resources to assist in the organisation of the local commemoration. An advisory group made up of, all of representatives of those affected by the Holocaust and subsequent genocides has been established and has already met on three occasions since September to plan the event. It has been agreed that the Northern Ireland commemoration will take place in the Marketplace Theatre in Armagh at 7 p.m. on Thursday, the 26th of January 2017, in order to avoid a clash with the Jewish Sabbath on Friday, the 27th of January. We are honoured that Mrs Mindu Hornig, an Auschwitz survivor, has agreed to be the keynote speaker at our commemoration, and it is expected that formal invitations to the event will issue in the next few weeks and that all MLAs will be invited. I call Gordon Dunn for supplementary. Thanks, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the First Minister for her answer. Can I ask the First Minister what engagement she has had with the local Jewish community, and in particular in relation to Walter Kammerling? and his connections to North Down. Well, I thank the member for supplementary. I have very recently been to visit uh, the local Jewish community in North Belfast at uh, their synagogue. Uh, I have to say it was a very pleasant evening where we shared a meal and I heard some of their concerns uh, at the moment, which of course uh, reflected some of the disgraceful attacks that have been happening, uh, not least um, the anti-Semitic symbols that have been spread on houses and the synagogue, and indeed the attack on the Jewish graves um, in Belfast City Cemetery on the 26th of August. So I wanted to go to the Jewish community uh, here in Northern Ireland and stand in solidarity with them against these uh, absolutely outrageous attacks on them as a, an ethnic minority uh, and indeed as a religious community here. In terms of Walter Kimmerling, um, he uh, is a very significant person for you in North Down, of course. He's now 93 years of age, having escaped Nazi persecution when he left Vienna uh, in 1938 at the tender age of 15. And he made his way via kinder transport to uh, Malayal in County Down, where, of course, the Belfast Jewish community 
had leased a farm and uh, Walter ended up there and lived for three years uh, in Malile. And he's one of approximately 300 children who passed through that farm and very recently he's been involved in making a film about his experiences here in North Down and we very much look forward uh, to hearing and seeing that film and, and looking uh, at the past and the significant role that was played uh, by North Down at that time and I'm sure he as a representative for North Down is very very proud of the way in which they welcome people in. I call Jenny Palmer. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for her response thus far. Um, last month, uh, the Rabbi David Singer indicated that he believed that there had been an increase in anti-Semitism in Northern Ireland, and the Minister has touched on this. I wonder, how does the Executive intend to collect data during this mandate to monitor the levels of anti-Semitism within our society? Well, I thank the Member. Of course, we do. Uh, monitor hate crimes in general, uh, but we don't have a, a specific monitor in terms of anti-Semitic uh, hate crimes, and I think that's something that we need to consider, uh, particularly uh, given the rise, uh, and it's a very sad indication, I have to say, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, uh, when there are only a very small community of Jewish people living here, that yet people seek to attack uh, them, uh, their religion, and indeed uh, their consecrated graves. Uh, so I do think it's something that we need to consider and something to which I'll be giving some thought. Aaron, Sir Philip McGuigan. I call Philip McGuigan. Gary Melgut, uh, free last can call you. And just following on from uh, the last response in terms of monitoring uh, hate crime, can I ask the First Minister for an update on the current executive response to hate crime? Well, as I've indicated, uh, recorded hate crime um, has uh, not risen as it unfortunately has in England and Wales uh, recently, uh, but it really is an incomplete metric of how much uh, hate crime is actually occurring. And, uh, uh, for example, an, incre an increase in confidence to report hate crime and awareness uh, how to report a hate crime will lead to an increase in reported crime, even though there hasn't been an increase, there's just been a, an increased awareness or an increased confidence in reporting. So uh, we need to uh, look at these hate crime statistics to see if we can monitor them uh, in a more effective way. And I hope that the racial equality subgroup, uh, which we have set up, um, which has met twice already, um, which is due to meet again in December, uh, will assist us in our deliberation on these issues. Aaron, sir, Justin McNulty. I call Justin McNulty. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the First Minister for her answers thus far. Can the First Minister outline whether there are plans to extend Holocaust Memorial Day services to include more primary school children? Well, I don't have that detail uh, in front of me. I know certainly uh, that we very much want to be able to educate young people as to the horrors of what happened in the past. Um, particularly in relation to the Jewish community and certainly the Walter Kimmerling film uh, when it comes out I think would be a very appropriate way to engage with young people uh, given that he travelled here when he was a young person uh, and uh, was very warmly welcomed into Northern Ireland so I certainly pass on those comments to officials who are involved in planning National Holocaust Day as I say uh, they have identified Armagh as a place to host uh, for this year and I very much hope to be in Armagh to mark uh, that very important anniversary. Aaron, Sir Patsy McLone. I call Patsy McLone. I got a mouthful for you. Last question, call you. Kesh, ever a three. Uh, question number three. We now know that the memo published in the Times was not an official UK government document. It was produced by Deloitte, and even they have confirmed it was not commissioned by the Cabinet Office and was prepared without access to Number Ten or input from any other government departments. Clearly, it did not reveal anything of the UK government's position. Having said that, it should not be a surprise to anyone that the UK has not yet finalised its plans for leaving the European Union. Indeed, if they had, I would be concerned, given that they are in detailed discussions with us to help shape the plan. They are still at the information gathering and analysis stage, which is a huge task covering many areas of government. We are currently feeding our own assessment of the issues into this process through the Joint Ministerial Committee and extensive bilateral engagement between officials. We would not expect nor want the UK Government to adopt a position until they have considered all the issues and implications, including for Northern Ireland. 
The Prime Minister has made it clear that we will be fully involved and represented in the development of a UK approach. We will continue to take every opportunity to reiterate our agreed priorities and to emphasise the unique nature of our situation. Patsy McLone for a supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer and shedding some light on that. Unfortunately, it appears any journalist with a good camera can get an insight into the Brexit stance of what the UK Government is at the moment. Um, would, would the, the uh, Minister agree that, uh, or would she support, like the Deputy First Minister, the tabling of a legislative consent motion in this Assembly on the triggering of Article 50? Uh, no, I do not, uh, because I believe that is a matter for the Westminster Parliament. Uh, obviously, uh, there are issues now in front of the Supreme Court. Uh, those matters will have to be heard. Um, we are not officially a party as an executive, but uh, I have to say all of the issues that were heard in the Belfast Court are now before the Supreme Court, uh, so obviously we are an interested party and our Attorney General uh, will be there as well. Uh, so we will have a full understanding of the Supreme Court decision when it comes. I call Mike Nesbitt. Does the First Minister think it's practical to adopt a policy of having cake and eating cake? Well, if the question is, uh, should we have ambition for Northern Ireland outside yeah. of the European Union? Yes, we should. Yeah. Yes, we should. Um, and uh, that's exactly what we're doing. We want to ensure that we have the maximum access uh, to the single market, as we agreed at the British Irish Council with all of our other colleagues uh, from the devolved administrations. We want to uh, make sure that the uh, border between the Republic of Ireland and uh, the United Kingdom is not a hard one, as we agreed with all of our colleagues. Uh, and I think there is a growing consensus, um, not just in the United Kingdom and Ireland, but actually at Europe uh, in the understanding of uh, the situation of Northern Ireland in terms of its history uh, and its geography. So uh, certainly, if it's about ambition, I think we should definitely lead the way and have ambition for this place. I call Maris Bradley. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy uh, Principal Speaker. Uh, I'd like to thank the Minister for her answers so far, but can I ask the Minister, is she satisfied with the level of engagement with the UK Government concerning Brexit? Well, yes, I am, uh, because the Prime Minister has come here. We have uh, together gone to the Joint Ministerial uh, Committee plenary session. Again, we were back at the uh, European Exit Joint Ministerial Committee um, because the Deputy First Minister and I are in China next week. Uh, some ministerial colleagues will go to the next Joint Ministerial Committee meeting, and the Secretary of State for exiting the European Union has made it very clear that it, uh, if at any time uh, we have any issues that we want to raise with him, we should contact him directly uh, and raise those issues directly with him. And I don't think he can be more open than that. Aram, sir, or Linda Dillon. I call Linda Dillon. If what you're outlining, Minister, is the case, then would it not be fair for the ministers to share that information with their committees? Well, of course, we're still at the, as I said in my substantive answer, uh, we're still at the analysis and information gathering stage. No positions have been taken in relation uh, to what the UK negotiation position is going to be because they're still trying to understand all of the different positions across uh, the United Kingdom. So, uh, as the Prime Minister herself has very clearly said, we should not engage in a running commentary. People in this place should know that when one enters into negotiations, uh, positions sometimes have to change and there has to be uh, trade-offs in order to achieve an end agreement, uh, and I'm sure that this will be no different. I call Stephen Farry. Um, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, in light of the deep concerns expressed by many businesses across the UK, uh, the, the agriculture sector, particularly here in Northern Ireland, the uh, warnings from the financial markets uh, and the looming budget deficit, could the First Minister explain her remarks to her party conference when she said this was actually the, the greatest opportunity for Northern Ireland for decades? Well, yet again, I will reiterate the position uh, in relation to ambition. 
Other people might want to talk down. What has happened, I see it as a tremendous opportunity uh, for Northern Ireland. It's a chance to be innovative. It's a chance to be flexible. It's a chance to lead Northern Ireland uh, in terms of being in an open, welcoming, regional part of the United Kingdom. It's a chance to go across the world and look for new trade deals. Uh, it's a chance uh, to give our fishermen more flexibility. And my goodness, wouldn't they welcome more flexibility in relation to what they've had to put up with from the European Union. So I do think uh, this is an opportunity to be welcomed. There will be short-term challenges. I've never shied away from that. But I think in the medium to longer term, we will be in a much stronger and better place. Aram, sir, Claire Hanna. I call Claire Hanna. Question four, which has been slightly lost in translation <laughs> from the submission. Um, sorry, it's no secret that the Deputy First Minister and I were on different sides of the argument leading up to the referendum. However, we are both committed to getting the best possible outcome for the people of Northern Ireland and are working together to achieve this. We are actively engaged with the UK Government to ensure the issues of particular significance for us are fully understood. The Prime Minister has assured us that we will be involved and represented in the negotiations on the terms of our future relationship with the European Union, and we intend to be. We are also working closely with the Irish Government to identify and scope issues of mutual interest and exert influence. We had a very positive meeting of the North-South Ministerial Council on the 18th of November, where we agreed to continue and intensify engagement through the NSMC sectoral meetings and between senior officials. Our joint objectives are set out in the letter we sent to the Prime Minister back in August, and we are working to achieve these. I call Claire Hanna for a supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank the First Minister. You referred, the First Minister referred to the growing understanding in Europe of our unique circumstances. Is the First Minister not worried at any level that London will look after the South East and that she and the Deputy First Minister need to seriously agree a detailed strategy and start fighting for Northern Ireland's access to the EU single market? Well, I'm not quite sure which part of the bit she missed from the previous answer in relation to maximum access to the single market. That's not just the position of the Fir Deputy First Minister and myself. Uh, it's the position of all of the British Irish Council delegates that met together last Friday. It was one of the four uh, issues that we put out after that meeting. Um, so it's difficult to see where the lady is coming from. I call Carla Lockhart. For her answers thus far. Does the First Minister agree that the most important relationship is not with the EU, but indeed with the United Kingdom? Well, absolutely. Of course, it's the most important relationship for Northern Ireland, particularly when you look at uh, where the sales of our goods uh, go to. 67% of the goods that are manufactured in Northern Ireland go to the UK market, including our own domestic market. Uh, I think that's something that has been frankly missed uh, by a lot of people when they talk about access to the European market. What they should be concentrating on is how we can increase uh, the amount of goods that we send into the UK market. And actually, there is an opportunity, to go back to Mr Farry's point about agriculture, there's a great opportunity for us to actually provide more of our agri-product uh, into the United Kingdom because there will be some displacement uh, from uh, European Union products. So I think there are opportunities, and we should take those opportunities. Instead of dwelling in the past, we should accept the vote has been taken and move on to the future. Aram, sir, Michelle Gildrenew. I call Michelle Gildrenew. Ramila Malgov, Prave Las Clancorla. Could I ask the First Minister what work is taking place to outline the impact of Brexit on border communities like those scattered right across my constituency? I certainly can see no positive impact at all. Well, I can see plenty of positives, and she mustn't be engaging with the same um, communities that I'm engaging with because uh, they seem to be benefiting greatly uh, at the moment from uh, what happened on the 23rd of June, particularly in Enniskillen. Um, however, we are engaging, of course, in relation to the common travel area with uh, uh, the Taoiseach and indeed with our own Prime Minister. Uh, every one of us wants to see the common travel area sustained, maintained, uh, to make sure that there is ease of access, uh, not just in relation to uh, Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, but also uh, in terms of Wales and the Republic of Ireland as well. And don't forget, the Crown dependencies are also part of that common travel area as well, so we need to be able to satisfy them as well. I call Philip Smith. Speaker. Uh, First Minister, yesterday Sinn Féin launched a document called Towards a United Ireland. In a covering letter from Gerry Adams, which we all received, he says that uh, the prospect of Northern Ireland being dragged out of the European Union has put the issue of Irish reunification back on the agenda. 
How can the public have any faith in the executive's ability to represent Northern Ireland's best interests on this issue when one half is so blatantly pursuing I their think, own party political issues? I think the issues? member has asked. Well, uh, we have made it clear in terms of the executive office that we will do all that is right in terms of the best interests of the people that we represent. Uh, in terms of the negotiations, in terms of making things right. I can't speak for uh, the President of Sinn Féin. I will never pretend to speak for the President of Sinn Féin. Uh, and if he wants to put out a document uh, along those lines, so be it for him. Because the reality is, and of course some people can't accept this, that the vote on the 23rd of June had absolutely nothing to do uh, with a vote in relation to the reunification uh, of Ireland. The two are completely separate. Uh, people were asked uh, in June if they wanted the United Kingdom as a nation state to remain within the European Union or leave the European Union. They give their decision in relation to that matter, and it has absolutely nothing uh, to do with a return to an All Ireland state. Aram Sir Cahal Boylan, I call Cahal Boylan. Kest Everakug, Leda Hall, question number five, please. Uh, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Ross to answer this question. Yeah, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, our department, in conjunction with the Victims and Survivors Service, the Commission for Victims and Survivors, and key stakeholders, have been taking forward a collaborative design programme of work to develop a comprehensive and high quality service which meets the needs of all victims and survivors. The outworkings of the collaborative design programme have clearly outlined the need for a new service delivery model which can address the longer term sustainability of programmes and eligibility concerns to help provide better outcomes for victims and survivors. We aim to have this new model operational from April 2017 onwards. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and could thank the junior minister for his answer, but could I ask just then following on from that, could he give me an overview of the collective design approach? That has informed this new delivery model. Um, well, the design program team has been set up, and it comprised personnel from both the executive office, from the Victims and Survivors Service, and from the Commission for Victims and Survivors, to ensure the development of an improved service delivery model capable of meeting the needs of victims and survivors. Uh, there was extensive engagement during that process. There was a series of workshops that, the workshops that were held uh, in order to identify the key priorities moving forward. Uh, those are uh, the areas that were identified included improving, improving the monitoring and evaluation for victims groups, uh, giving greater flexibility for individuals, uh, and the piloting of new ways of working on personalised budgets, caseworkers, and a better assessment of needs. Um, so all of this work um, has hopefully put us in a better position for us to move forward into the, uh, the next year. I call Philip Logan. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. Last week, the Executive announced over £30 million of new funding streams for victims. Uh, can the Junior Minister outline what these are and when the applications open? Uh, indeed, yes. Last week, we were delighted to be able to announce uh, new funding streams worth over £30 million. Uh, there were two identified. The first one is the Victim Support Programme, uh, which is worth £18.7 million. And the second is a piece for Shared Spaces and Services Programme worth £17.6 million. Euros. Um, both of these are designed to not only build capacity within uh, groups who are supporting and representing victims, but also to improve health and well-being of victims and survivors uh, right across Northern Ireland. Uh, the, the application process for both of those funding streams opened last week on the 24th of November, and I would encourage as many people to come forward and apply for that funding as possible, because, as we have said, it is a significant amount of money available, and I think it demonstrates the executive's commitments to the victims and survivors uh, sector. I call Robbie Butler. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, could I ask the Junior Minister, a year on from fresh start, what progress has been made on delivering a world-class trauma centre? I missed the last part of it. Could the Sorry. member repeat the question, please? Yes, indeed. Uh, a year on from fresh start, what progress has been made on delivering a world-class trauma centre? Thank you, and thank you for, for repeating that. Um, I think significant progress has been made. Um, the Department of health officials are continuing to lead in the establishment of the Mental Trauma Service for Northern Ireland, uh, which was announced by the, the Minister for Health back in September of 2015. Uh, that will meet the, the psychological need of victims and survivors. And it's not a, a purely medicalised model either. Uh, it will be an integrated uh, approach. 
uh, and the partnership agreement is being developed to define referral protocols between statutory and voluntary community sectors uh, as we speak. So I think there has been considerable progress made on that, and that coupled with the other programs, the other uh, services that are offered through the executive and arm's length bodies are helping people right across Northern Ireland deal with the many complex issues that are faced by victims and survivors. I called Chris Little for a very brief uh, supplementary. Could I ask the Justice Minister for an update on the creation of the post of sorry, no, junior, junior, junior Minister for an update on the creation of the post of victims advocate to assist victims and survivors to navigate the wide range of justice information and, and service provisions available to them? And a very quick answer from the junior minister. Well, we continue through the work of, of the executive office to help uh, victims and signpost them to the right place for assistance. We're also helping to build capacity within groups, uh, and hopefully, we'll be in a better position next, uh, next uh, in January time to outline how we intend to continue to move forward in this area. Shinjera Keshtina Listolcha. That uh, ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions. And Iram or Justin McNulty, I call Justin McNulty. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The First Minister will be aware a papal visit to Ireland has, was confirmed yesterday for August 2018. I welcome the First Minister's statement that she will meet the Holy Father. I hope the First Minister can show that she understands how important this can visit the will be please come for to a lot question. of people. Can the First Minister give an assurance that the Executive will be supportive of the visit? both vocally and in practical terms, and every effort will be made to work with local government to ensure that our towns and cities included are looking I, their very best, the just like I every other member, big I, event that's been held the member, here. I think the member has asked his question. Thank you. And many others beside. Um, indeed, I do, of course, understand the significance uh, of a papal visit. If such is, is to happen, uh, I noticed that uh, the Vatican did indicate uh, that they don't confirm visits until six months before any such visit were to take place. So I, I think there's been a lot of excitement by some people, um, but we will have to wait and see if, if that occurs. Uh, if it does occur, and if he comes uh, as a, a guest of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, as the head of state, of course, uh, I will meet him as the head of the Northern Ireland Executive, along with the Deputy First Minister. Justin McNulty for supplementary. Will the First Minister guarantee that the same level of commitment into uh, making our towns and cities look their very best? Uh, will the First Minister guarantee that work will be, the monies and funds will be available to local government to ensure we look our very best for the, for the visit of our Holy Father? Well, can I say to the member, I think we better get a visit confirmed first before we start to plan spending money because uh, uh, there's, uh, and I'm sure if the Finance Minister was here, he will bear this out. We will have a very difficult budget coming towards us uh, in uh, the next while, uh, and we need to very much look at what our priorities will be uh, over the next couple of years. And of course, uh, if such a visit uh, is to go ahead and is planned, uh, then we will make sure that Northern Ireland looks its best, as we try to do for all of the visitors that come to Northern Ireland. Aram Sir Trevor Lunn. I call Trevor Lunn. Gormley, I got that free last come, Carlia. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the First Minister, does she support the urgent provision of a pension for the people seriously injured and the troubles? Yes, I do, and the uh, Democratic Unionist Party has a very clear uh, view in relation to a pension for those who were seriously injured. Uh, and we must ensure that those people are facilitated, but we very firmly believe that it should only be available to those people who were innocent victims, and uh, therein lies part of the difficulty, as he will well know, because the definition of a victim, as it currently stands, includes those people uh, who were injured uh, when they were committing some of the most heinous crimes. Uh, and I certainly am not going to stand over giving money or a pension uh, to someone who was the author of his own misfortune. And can I congratulate the member on his beautiful Irish uh, before calling him for a supplementary? Yes, I uh, will not repeat it. <laughs> uh, yes, I thank the First Minister for the points she's made and the answers she's given. Um, some of us have met today with the Wave Injured Group. And could, so could I ask on their behalf if, uh, if and when the Executive Office will introduce seriously injured uh, pension legislation for consideration by this House, given the length of time that, as we all know, people have been waiting? 
wholeheartedly endorse WAVE's campaign, and I'm sure he will recognise that the campaign from WAVE for a special pension for those who suffered injuries through no fault of their own during the Troubles in Northern Ireland is something that we should take forward. So I await others who are ready to look at the definition of a victim, as he will know. Um, members of my party have tried in the past to have that discussion. Uh, unfortunately, it has not been proved to be able to change. But, however, we live in hope uh, that it can be changed so that people can get what is duly theirs. I call Morris Bradley. Thank you, Madam Deputy Principal Speaker. Uh, can I ask the First Minister uh, what her thoughts are on the exclusion of Northern Ireland sporting stars from the BBC Sports Pers Personality of the Year shortlist? I, well, I am. How shall I put this? She is not amused. <laughs> she is not amused. Um, I think it's absolutely scandalous um, yeah. that someone of Carl Frampton's. Um, ability and indeed uh, a double world champion should be excluded from the Sp sports personality of the year and i hear from my colleague another man who of course should have been thought of as well jonathan ray who again is a double world champion uh, what about bethany firth um, and indeed what about michael mcgovern that man from fermanagh who uh, did uh, sterling work for the Northern Ireland team during the Euros. So I think there is a huge hole, Madam uh, uh, Deputy Speaker, in Principal Deputy Speaker, in relation to sports personality of the year. Despite the fact that they have increased from 12 to 16, they have managed to leave out some of the very special sporting stars from Northern Ireland. I call Morris Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you. Madam, uh, First Minister has already alluded to the, the wealth of sporting talent we have here in the province, and we are contributors to the service as licensed payers. Are there any, can I ask the First Minister, are there any plans for the BBC, to challenge the BBC on this matter? Well, I understand from my colleague who has just joined me, the Minister for Communities, that he is going to be raising this directly with the BBC Head of Sport, uh, Barbara Slater, um, because I, I do think when you look at the judging panel, um, there, there is a problem, and uh, they obviously aren't aware of uh, other sports, um, and uh, we really need to bring this to their attention. Because, of course, the members, right? We're all licence fee payers, and therefore this should be taken into consideration. So, as I say, the Minister for Communities intends to raise this directly with the BBC. I call Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and could I first of all thank the Minister for attending the launch of the CS Lewis Square? last week. And would the, the First Minister agree with me that this is the sort of initiative, successful initiative, that this executive and this assembly should be supporting? Well, can I congratulate East Belfast um, and, uh, on a wonderful space, open space, um, to commemorate one of their most famous sons. And uh, I have to say it's a tremendous example of partnership working. Um, the community, Conswater Greenway, um, Belfast City Council, uh, the Lottery, uh, and indeed, of course, um, the Communities Department here from the Executive Office. Uh, I think it is a tremendous way in which we can regenerate urban spaces in a very meaningful way. And also, I was, have to say to him, really taken by the number of children that was there, were there on that occasion uh, as they were looking on with uh, great awe and admiration at the huge statues that have been put in place. Uh, down in C.S. Lewis Square, and I hope uh, that they all get as much enjoyment out of the works of C.S. Lewis as my generation did at the time. I call Sammy Douglas for supplement. Uh, could I thank the First Minister for her answer thus far? And, and First Minister, last Sunday, um, after a few days of the opening, there were um, six tours of C.S. Lewis, 30 on each tour, bunged out. Um, could I ask if the First Minister if she believes that tourism is a big driver for these types of initiatives and also to thank the Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland Tourist Board or Tourism Northern Ireland? Yes, Tourism Northern Ireland uh, indeed do a tremendous work in marketing um, these initiatives uh, and indeed Tourism Ireland as well. And can I say to him that I think the wonderful thing about tourism uh, is the fact that it can um, be a job creation initiative. Uh, an economic driver uh, for the whole of Northern Ireland. So when you get uh, a local story or, or a local hook 
uh, then you are able to tell the world about your own local environment. And I've seen some marvellous examples of that. Of course, the Deputy First Minister and I were at Seamus Heaney's home place recently, another tremendous example of how you can use culture and someone's birthplace as a way to bring tourists and uh, those who are looking to expand their mind um, to Balaki. And I think it's a tremendous uh, initiative that has gone on there as well. So two great giants, Seamus Heaney, C.S. Lewis, uh, and it's about time that we started to recognise what they have done for this place. I call Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker. And can I ask the Minister for an update on her planned visit to China? Yes, the Deputy First Minister and I uh, will leave for China on uh, Sunday, very, very early. And uh, we have a full programme uh, from Monday morning uh, when we will be meeting with um, uh, the Northern Ireland Bureau in China. Indeed, we're going to open our Bureau, um, and that's going to be a very important staging post for us uh, out in the Far East. Uh, we're hoping uh, to meet uh, Madam Lee Yangdong, who was here in Northern Ireland some years ago when she met with the then First Minister and Deputy First Minister and indeed all of the executive and took in some of our tourism opportunities. We are going to uh, be meeting with Bombardier, who of course have a facility out uh, in China, in Shenyang, meeting with other um, very important dignitaries as well in Shenyang. Uh, and then, of course, meeting with various um, investment opportunities here to Northern Ireland, uh, and we will return to Northern Ireland on Friday of next week. Gordon Dunn for a supplementary. Thank you, Madam Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answer. Following our successful year of food and drink and the quality of products available, what opportunities exist for further exports of our quality products into new markets like China? Well, indeed, we will be looking for opportunities, not least uh, for our agri-sector um, and, uh, in particular, our pork sector out in China. Um, and uh, we, no doubt, will be eating some of the fare from China, uh, things we do for Ulster. And uh, we will then be bringing them um, the message that Northern Ireland is very much open for business uh, and wants to do business with China as well. So the agri-food sector will be very much a strong part of what we'll be talking about when we go to China. Here I'm Sir Linda Dillon. I call Linda Dillon. Could the Minister provide an update on the Vulnerable Persons Relocation Scheme? Um, in terms of uh, refugees coming to Northern Ireland, we've had a very successful um, integration of those who have come here. I think I'm right in saying, the Junior Minister will keep me right, we've had five uh, groups of uh, families mostly coming to reside here in Northern Ireland. They have been spread out across Northern Ireland and I have to say a great deal of praise and commendation should go to officials right across the piece who have worked very, very hard to make sure that those who come to Northern Ireland for a new life uh, are given all of the support that they require. Linda Dillon for supplement. What more does the Minister believe can be done to help reassure our migrant and foreign national communities that they are welcome in our communities? We have been taking a ministerial lead in relation uh, to these matters through our junior ministers uh, and indeed through uh, ourselves as well. This time last year, I think it was probably later in December, uh, the Deputy First Minister and myself then as Finance Minister visited our very first group of refugees that had come to Northern Ireland. Um, of course, we can do that, therefore, by uh, very positive leadership. Uh, we have, of course, also set up our racial equality uh, subgroup. And the refugee integration strategy uh, is being drafted uh, at the moment, and uh, we hope will be out for pre-consultation very soon uh, with a number of very important stakeholders. So that is going on as well. I call Paul Frew. Much, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Uh, Speaker uh, can I ask the uh, First Minister to give us an update or provide an update on the uh, Rugby uh, World Cup bid? 
Yes, at the, uh, I think it was two weeks ago now, um, yes it is, two weeks ago, uh, the Rugby World Cup bid was officially uh, launched between ourselves and the Irish Government. Um, our main competitors appear to be uh, France and uh, the Republic of South Africa. Uh, we are quietly hopeful, if not confident, uh, that we can attain the Rugby World Cup for 2023. Um, and we say that because uh, we have been doing some lobbying and some very hard work behind the scenes, but also the fact that we haven't had the Rugby World Cup and the other two jurisdictions have already hosted the Rugby World Cup in their own countries. And Paul flew for a very quick supplementary. Thank you. Well, the first minister to take this opportunity, as I will, to congratulate Rory Best in yeah. his 100 caps uh, for Irish yeah. rugby and to acknowledge the great achievement that that actually is for the, the man himself and the great personality that he is. I'm very pleased that you've mentioned that because rugby of, uh, Rory is, of course, one of our greatest sporting ambassadors, and we're incredibly proud of what he achieved uh, on Saturday evening. Not just because he got a win, uh, because it was his 100th cap, and can he take from this place, I hope, the support of the whole House uh, for what he has achieved wearing the green shirt. Uh, 